Uh, so the gentleman who's very eager to get to the cocktail, his name is Chris Bloom. He's a member of the class of 73. Um, he is an attorney by day, but also a certified trained mixologist who currently serves as counsel to the United States Bartenders Guild and the United States Bartending, Girl, Belt, Bartending Guild National Charity Foundation, because the best thing to do is be a bartender and also help your fellow bartenders. So Chris is gonna teach us about how to make the quintessential martini. And since you probably wanna hear more about that than hear me, I'm gonna let Chris take it away. So um, do, do we by any chance have a presentation available or? I just, by the way, just two slides before we make the drink, not, we'll, we'll have a drink first before we do anything too serious. Yeah. Do we all see slide? Yeah. Bingo. Excellent. All right. Take it away, Chris. All righty. Well, why don't we get to the second slide? <laughs> I think I'd like a martini. Um, uh, the, uh, there, there is a poem out there uh, that is sometimes attributed to Dorothy Parker, although I think that's a bit controversial, uh, which goes, I think I'd like a martini one, maybe two at the most, two and I'm under the table, three and I'm under my host. So with that in mind, with my Kenyan spirit, uh, let's go forward and make the martini. Uh, next slide. So this is the classic martini um, uh, recipe. Um, and these days, this kind of recipe would be, would be seen as a quote, wet martini because it has a half ounce um, uh, of, um, or approximately uh, one fifth um, uh, of vermouth, not just a little bit. Um, and so I'm gonna make that martini um, and we'll talk about this later, but I'm going to choose Noily Platt, do it this way, vermouth, can you see that, I hope. Um, as uh, the vermouth, um, mostly because um, in the world of bartenders, this would be considered sort of the bog standard. Um, also, you should know that vermouth is a wine. So if, I, if it's open for more than a week, it's going to go bad. So if you're going to have a wet martini, you have to have it with a fresh bottle. The good news is this is about an eight or nine dollar bottle of vermouth. And as long as you have a couple friends over, it's, it's, it, it is uh, uh, very competitive. Um, I'm also, I'm going to use, as I was saying before, uh, because this is Philadelphia, a local Philadelphia gin. This is Blue Coat gin. It's, a, it's a, made in Philadelphia. It's an excellent gin. And then, and this is optional and slightly controversial. Um, I, I'm going to use bitters. And orange bitters is what historically was used. You can go without it, even classically you can go without it, but I really find that that and the remove gives you a really, really interesting and lovely drink. We'll talk about the history of it a bit later. And I'm not an olive guy. I really like 11 twist. So the way you make 11 twist uh, is that you take a, a channel knife and you, and you twist, you get a, a strip. And then if you've done it, yeah, after you've done it, you can twist it around a spoon like this. And you end up with this wonderful curl, which I'm gonna put in as a garnish. So is this the right recipe? It is certainly the classic recipe. The next question is, how should it be made? Next slide, please. Shaken or stirred? A lot of discussion about that. Um, so I need, uh, and, and I think the time has come for those we want to make with me, to make with me. And you can make either a shaken or a stirred one. I'm gonna do a shaken one. I hope I have a volunteer out there who's gonna do a stirred one with me. That's me. Good. So I'm gonna take 
to make our martini, we need to put ice in our shaker or in our stirring uh, cup. So I've got ice in here in the shaker. Now we have to put the ingredients in. The ingredients are gin. I use measuring cups because I can't do it any other way. These are small measuring cups and I'm gonna put two and a half ounces of gin. And half an ounce of vermouth. And no, nope, I'm opening it right now. Hey, Chris, it's Julie. I'm sorry. Yes. Would you be able to take the slide down so we can see you better? Sure. Yeah. Great. Oh, Thank you good. so much. Yeah, I know this is this technology is hard. <laughs> that's well, the end of the sort of mixed well. message. We'll go back to me. Thank you for thank you for suggesting it. Could you repeat how much vermouth? Uh, two and a half, I uh, don't know, half an ounce of vermouth. Thank two you. Yeah. Essentially five to one. Or, and then a couple dashes of orange bitters. Um, orange as opposed to the Agostina? Uh, you can use Angostino. Again, I'm going straight classic. The classic would have been orange, but also classically you could have had Angostura. And I even have Angostura here. Uh, okay. I want it. I like the orange um, for this drink, but there's another drink or two that uses Angostura on the list. Um, and it, it is sort of dealer's choice. Answer your question, people. Thank you. All right. So you'll notice that I iced my glass. And now I'm going to shake. People ask how many shakes, how many stirs. Basically, the rule is 40 shakes or 40 stirs. Um, and what you want to do is give it some bigger. And that will shake it up, that'll mix it up right. And that will give us the martini. And this is a chicken martini, just the way James Bond. Does. <laughs> Not enough room here, sorry. All's well, sorry about that. How are you doing with the stirring there? I did fine with mine. So I have delegated. You didn't break anything, did you? No. Like, I didn't break anything, actually. Chris, you may have covered this before I joined, but is that a bottle of blue coat in front of yes, you? Yes, it is. A, a yeah. proud Philadelphia product. Uh, That's and, the reason I did it. And did you uh, discuss much, uh, the different kinds of gins yet? No, we're going to deal with that in a, in, in a bit. I thought I'd give everyone a drink before he got too serious. I, I'm at I'm at the office still, so and uh, we're not madmen here, so. <laughs> At any rate, so there's my drink having been shaken. Have you got your drink? Yes, I have, I have mine stirred. Have you strained it out? And I have I've not taken a sip yet. I have I have um, delegated the stirring to my husband Seth here. Okay, so I want to see it once it comes off. This uh, is mine. Pour it into the. He's making. We're doing a side by side. Oh, okay. So he made his with Tanqueray and mine with Hendrix. Ah, great drink, gems. Mm -hmm. So can we see the, I want to see the stirred one if I can. There we go. 
Can you can yeah. you see me? Oh, I pinned yeah. myself, which I'm maybe now regretting. Yeah, and that's this is the it's one that that yeah. is that was shaken. Oh. What you should notice is that the one I have shaken is cloudy. Mm -hmm. and it, we will come back to this in a minute. And so most people would say you want to stir a clear, uh, the clear elixir, and it means there's less water and less ice in the drink. I'm going to drink this one anyway. I like it fine. Cheers, Kenyan people. Cheers. Cheers. There is a substantial theory that Ian Fleming, who knew his cocktails extremely well, deliberately had uh, James Bond order his uh, uh, martini shaken, knowing that that was not the gentleman's preferred way to have it, to show a bit of James Bond's rough background. And there are whole articles on the subject of how James Bond orders his drinks, and uh, uh, and he because he didn't just have martinis in the books, and how that shows his character um, uh, as it goes forward. Um, for those of you who like old movies, um, I suggest you take a look at Casablanca and count the number of cocktails in Casablanca. <laughs> there are about 12 and <laughs> is specifically assigned to characters based on who they are, what they're about. Um, so it, it, it's kind of a fun way to watch Casablanca for the hundredth time, to just look at the cocktails as they come out in Rick's cafe. Um, in any event, cheers, everyone. Uh, if you have a cocktail, do uh, you want it? Can we go back and put up the slide a minute? The next slide a minute? Sorry about the confusion. Okay, next slide. So this is literally the difference, the way the two look. Um, uh, made by a professional um, and, and shows that the difference is the uh, uh, cloudiness of the one that is shaken as opposed to stirred. Um, uh, and then can we go to the next slide? So this slide is called Getting to Know You. So we thought we'd take a break, give the next slide, please. And We'd like to have each of you at least give your name, your class, and sort of where you're from, uh, where you're in from, uh, before we move on to the rest, because not everybody knows who else is on this call. In, in the interest of smooth intros, I'm going to be the uh, president of introductions. So I'm going to call on everyone in the order you appear in my personal film strip. And I will be your model as well. Don't make another shake right now. Um, I'm Meredith Methley. I'm the class of 2000. Um, this is my husband, Seth Reichgott. He's not a Kenyan alum. He's a I went to Wesleyan. Yeah, but we'll let him stick around tonight. Uh, and we are joining from the Germantown section of Philadelphia. Uh, and Julie, you and Jim are next on my list. I'm Julie Miller Vick, class of 73. And this is Jim Vick class of 74. I will just add that I believe I first saw Casablanca on a Friday night in Ross Hall. At Ross Hall. <laughs> <laughs> and, the audience, and the audience was probably not quiet. Yeah. <laughs> you, were, you were not observing the cocktails that night in the way that Chris just suggested, perhaps. By the way, I forgot to put the garnish in. I always make a mistake. In goes my garnish, sorry. Kristen, you're next for me. Oh, Kristen Richardson. Kristen Richardson, class of 84. And I live just up the road from Meredith in Mount Airy. And I also made the third version because I don't have a shaker. 
Kristen, right. your, your internet signal makes you sound very drunk right now. I just want you to know that in case anyone asks you later if you're really drunk because you were a little delayed, just as a heads up. <laughs> Next up, I feel like all of our Kenyan and Philly people are, are clustered at the front. So Claudia and Colin, you're next. Hi, everyone. I'm Claudia Smith, class of 05. And I'm oh, Colin wow. Smith, oh, 06. Who's to say I wasn't practicing? <laughs> oh, boy. And uh, we're in Haddonfield, New Jersey, along with Julia and Jim. I like how both the Haddonfield couples have the older woman and the younger man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so quick, Meredith. <laughs> Peter Bluefeld, you are next. I'm Peter. I'm also the class of 73, and I'm calling from, I'm zooming in from Center City, Philadelphia, where I both live and work. Awesome. Nice to meet you, Peter. Alan, nice Frigi, I think you're next. Hi, Al Frigi, class of 73, uh, zooming in from Decatur, Illinois, about 180 miles south of Chicago. And it's of note that I've only begun uh, re-drinking gin within the last couple of years after a very unfortunate event during my freshman year at Kenya. <laughs> Tell us more. <laughs> I, feel, I feel the same way about rum, Alan, although it was after I graduated, but it was at a Kenyan party. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Julie Next wanted, up. Julie wanted more information. Um, yes. To the best of my recollection, it somehow involved gin and Gatorade, uh, and it wasn't very pleasant. <laughs> You're supposed to drink the Gatorade after you've had too much gin, not together. Yeah, well, that's not the way it was uh, presented to me, so. <laughs> gotcha. Well, welcome, Alan from Decatur. Uh, next up, Rob Rockhold. Uh Afternoon, everybody. Rob Rockhold, also class of 73. Uh, my freshman experience was actually with grain alcohol, and that's enough to say about that. Uh, I'm, uh, I prefer shaken. Uh, I'm a, a particular fan of, of the original Vesper, uh, but made with lime slice instead of lemon. Great choice. Excellent. Yeah, grain alcohol is probably never a good idea. No, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Rob. Next Thank up, you. Hannah Stewart. Hi, everyone. My name's Hannah, class of 2012, and I'm joined by my boyfriend, Corey. He's an Ohio State graduate, and we are doing the stirred martini. I see everyone. Excellent. Are you in Ohio now? Oh, I didn't mention that. We're in New York City. Okay, welcome from Philadelphia. Next up is Janet Lord. Hi everyone, great to see you. Um, I am coming in from Baltimore, Maryland. I'm a graduate of the class of 88. My daughter graduated in 19 and I'm joined here by my wife, Julie Murtis, a graduate of Cornell. And uh, while at Kenyon, I did my junior year abroad in Scotland. So I really developed a, a taste for single malt whiskey as well. This is fun, thank you. I, I'm right there with you, Janet. I didn't do the whole year, I just did the spring, but yes, I spent a spring term in Edinburgh and developed a very expensive whiskey habit and probably was the only member of the senior class drinking Glenlivet at the Cove back in the day. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, Elise Bowers, you're next on my list. Hello, everyone. I am not drinking because I am taking down a huge oak tree in my side yard. So I was otherwise occupied. So I'm with you in spirit. And I bought all the stuff today. So I'll be making one when we're all done. I'm outside of Philadelphia in Harleysville, PA, class of 82. Great idea. Lots of uh, fun seeing everybody and meeting everyone. Thank you. Awesome. Good luck with the tree, Elise. And thanks for joining us. And I believe you will very much earn that cocktail when you're done. Thank you. Next up is Steve Thompson. I, I'm from the class of 74. 
I'm not drinking tonight because I'm I'm teaching tomorrow. I'm at Penn State University and and in State College. I still have my class to prepare. I've not uh, in all these years. I have not uh, decided to do homework early, so I still have class to prepare for for tomorrow morning. And maybe I'll do something later. Hi, Jim. Hey. Important question though. What do you teach? Yeah, I'm, I'm in, in the graduate program in acoustics, so I'm teaching acoustic transducers, loudspeakers, and microphones and Stuff like that. You Very can't think cool. that. Very cool. I don't have anything clever to say about that, but it sounds awesome. <laughs> Rick, thanks for coming. Next up is Dee. Hi everyone, I'm Dee Dee Yoki. Um, I have currently lived in, in the last four years, um, New York City, was on the regional um, committee there, um, and now I serve on the Philly committee, but I am currently living in um, in UN, New Jersey. Thank you all for being here. I'm not necessarily rocking purple in color, but I do have it on my nails and we're intentional this week about that. But again, thank you for being here and this is really exciting. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Dee. And what Dee is not telling you is that she's actually on call for her student affairs gig. We have a lot in common in terms of our student affairs lives. So she may have to, hopefully not, but rescue some child who has gone the way of grain alcohol or too much gin and Gatorade, et cetera. So we hope you don't have to. And Tristan, you get to do yourself next. Oh, hello everyone. I'm, I'm Tristan Naviska, class of 2013. Um, Coming to you from stormy Fredertown, Ohio, just 20 minutes north of Gambier. Um, I, I, my internet was knocked out, so I missed what the other prompt was. Uh, you got, you covered, oh, just your class, but your, um, your uh, Zoom tells us that your class of 2013. Perfect. Hope your internet sticks by. <laughs> and that the storm's not coming to Philadelphia next. Um, I think it looks like we have two more people in the list. It's John, mono named John. You, you're muted and you don't, oh, no camera yeah. or mic. Okay, well, nice to meet you from Cave Creek, Arizona. 1964. Class of 64, teetotaler. Well, you can still learn about chemistry even if you don't partake in the experiments, right? Welcome, sorry about your mic. And last and but not least, we have Marion Crandall. Crandall? Crandall. Crandall. Uh, and I'm sitting in a library, so I'm speaking quietly, and I'm not making a drink. <laughs> <laughs> not the appropriate location, but I'm um, in Princeton, New Jersey, so a neighbor of um, these. And um, I'm looking forward to making a drink once I get out of the library. <laughs> Well, oh, and I'm class of 78. Excellent. Well, books are the next best thing to cocktails. And I will briefly say that one of the times I almost got in trouble was during my senior year of Kenyon that a bunch of us thought it would be a good idea to make cocktails in the library. And, um, you know, which is great because there's, you know, cameras. And we heard over the loudspeaker, will the people with the bottles of alcohol please leave the library now? <laughs> They didn't appreciate but i hope you get your cocktail when you get back home so well and there's nothing better there's nothing that. better than books and cocktails i 100 percent agree it's more yeah. than double yes the most kenyan sentence i've heard all day absolutely <laughs> i was just gonna say sound like an english major <laughs> yes me like me too right awesome well thank you all for coming virtually and introducing yourselves and i will now that we all know who each other are we'll turn back over to chris would you like your presentation? Yes, I need the presentation. Sorry if it blocks me, but I think that's improving that. No, you're good. Give me one sec. My apologies, I forgot to hit screen share first. You think I would remember how to use Zoom this, at this point in a pandemic, but apparently not. There we go. Terrific. So here we go. Uh, I want to talk for a little bit about the coming of the Martini and, some, uh, and how it came to be uh, enough so that you can get your um, 
your credit for this course. Uh, I'm not sure who issues the certificates, but there you have it. All right, next slide, please. So before there were cocktails, there, were, there was punch. Um, and punch was really the prequel to cocktails. Um, it was the first um, globally popular tipple. Um, and it really was spirits killer app in our current terms. Um, and up until then, people drank beer and cider and wine. And that really worked until they started to really have to travel long distances because beer and cider and wine don't last for two months in a ship's hold, particularly in an era when there's no refrigeration. And go back, please. Yep. Um, and uh, the need for a new drink became apparent when the East India Company was chartered in 1601. Now, you probably learned about East India Company when you were in college, but you didn't know how it related to drink. And it does in an important way. The first trading mission set sail with four ships, 480 men, and they had to have supplies for those men. Um, we, we, we see some of that right now um, in, 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 the, in the war that's going on. You know, supplies are everything. So they had four ships and 480 men, and yes, they were men. Sorry about that. That was the euro. Um, and they had 1,100 tons of freight available in their, in their holds, but they had to use up 420 of them for fermented beverages to feed people on the way to India. And you can see that that's probably a reduction. And that meant that you were going to get only a 60% yield when you got to the other side. Um, so next slide, please. So one has to look at what these this is East India trade routes were. And this is a, a sketch of the trade routes uh, in the 17th, 16th, 17th century uh, by sailboat. And you, the, the bottom left there is just gives you an idea of the sailboats. You've probably been on these. These were 30, 35 foot boats, very deep hulls, but they couldn't hold only so much. And they had to go all the way around Africa to get to India. That was the principal trade route. Uh, we can also talk about Americas, but let's stay with that. And so, so what's going on here is you needed to be able to serve something to drink to all these sailors. And of course, just you can't drink the water, uh, salt water, so you have to have it in the hold. Um, and it was much better to be using liquor. We went farther. Um, and you, you could take and mix in it the citruses and the uh, spices that were now coming to back to England from the other explorations to the New World. So by 1658, uh, Edward Phillips writes essentially the first uh, English dictionary. Um, and uh, he defines punch for the first time. And it's a kind of Indian drink, which is a clue to the fact that punch was really related to this trade with India. Next slide, please. What was what did punch have in it? The, the punch of, of that era had a bunch of uh, five elements. It had spirits, uh, alcohol of some sort, water, sugar, citrus juice and some spice, nutmeg was the usual one, but it could be any spice. And the way this came down was strong, weak, sweet, sour spice. And a popular um, uh, song of that era said, you may talk of brisk claret, sing praises of sherry, speak well of old hot mum cider and perry, but you much drink punch if you mean to be merry. Those other, uh, uh, if you don't know what old hock and mum and cider and perry, uh, that per the, these are equivalents of apple cider. Um, Perry is uh, a cider made from um, uh, pears. Um, 
and more of like closer to a beer today. But punch, punch at a real spirit. In it. Next, please. Slowly, but not, but inevitably, punch became popular because of its association with the British Navy. Excuse me, I need a drink. Cheers. <laughs> and I really love this quote from Alexander Pope, who some of you would have studied at Kenyon, uh, because you wouldn't have thought this, but he got an invitation to attend a punch party, well, a party, but the punch was going to be served um, on a, a, a British uh, ship of the line in London. And this was a very big honor. And he, he responded to, the, to, to Lord Peterborough in 1732, I decline no danger where the glory of Great Britain is concerned and will contribute to empty the largest bowl of punch that shall be rigged out on such an occasion. But if Alexander Pope is talking that way, everyone's talking about it. That was the best invitation. That was like the Grammys and the Oscars combined. Although the Oscars, who knows? Anyhow, that, that 1732, so by then, punch was clearly the thing. Next slide, please. So how do we get to cocktail? Well, of course, we decided to, 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 to revolt from the Brits. Um, and shortly after the revolution in 1806, we first see and the, the, uh, uh, the picture in the upper corner is uh, the, a newspaper account for a cocktail. And that cocktail essentially follows the form of what, we, what, today, what today we would call an old fashioned. So springing forward and coming back by the 1870s and 1880s, lots of different cocktails, a lot of them had lots of sweet and fruit fruit ingredients, and people would go into bars and say, I don't want any of that newfangled stuff. Give me one of those old-fashioned cocktails, meaning from the beginning of the 1800s. And what did it have? It had, was a punch with strong spirits, water, sugar, citrus, bitters. You see again, strong, weak, sweet, sour, spice. The difference between cocktail and punch was that punch was made in a bowl in big quantities, um, usually in punch houses. By the way, it was the one job a woman could get that was, was respectable, uh, standing at the end of a table from a bunch of drunk guys, frankly. But, uh, and she would mix the, the punch, and the punch was always with a bottle of spirits uh, like this. And she would break the seal in front of all the guests, and there'd be 10 or 12 guests, and then she'd make the punch and serve it out. But it was very much, that, that, that allowed everyone to know that it was not a watered drink. And the punch houses came to be very, very fashionable in London and elsewhere, and, and that, that is what was in, uh, in fashion in, in the uh, 1700s at the time of the revolution. Come to 1806, the Americans are going to do something. They're going to make it a single glass pour. It's going to be fast and it's going to be customized in the American way. You can have gin, you can have rum, you can have lime, you can have this spice, you can have what you want. We're going to make punch in a glass. By the way, I think it's the only contribution America ever really made the culinary, the culinary uh, activities in the world. Next slide, please. <laughs> so that's sort of that background. I want to take you to what is in the drink. Next slide, please. Mm. Alcohol. Yep, got it. And for those of you who were science and chemistry majors, this will be easy. And those who are consumers, it'll be interesting to learn. So to have alcohol, to get alcohol, you have to ferment. And the process of fermenting is a process of 
converting carbohydrates, things sugars, to alcohol in a microorganism, yeast or bacteria. By the way, you can set the, the, the uh, carbohydrate like apple cider is made this way by just putting apples out in water and waiting for the micro, the yeast or bacteria to come. We've been doing this since 1700 BC, no new stuff. But to get alcohol, you have to take that fermented mash and separate out the alcohol from that mash. And if, for those of you who want the chemical formulation, there it is. Uh, basically, you're taking the carbohydrate, which is on the left, you add some water, you heat it, and you get a, a reaction, you come out with 2C2H5OH, which is alcohol, and then you get some CO2. So if any of you have ever been to, to a distillery, you will find, smell an awful lot of CO2 uh, because that's the waste product. By the way, the environmentalists have a lot to say about this more later. Um, but doing this results in all sorts of things. Everything you think of, mead, cider, bitter, wine. Um, but the distillation will separate the alcohol from the fermented. Next slide, please. And to do that, you have to distill. This is a friend of mine uh, who owns North Shore Distillery, uh, a really great um, uh, small um, producer, uh, actually quite similar in some ways. Not, uh, I won't get into quality distinctions to, to what is done by Blue Coat, and that's a pot still. And the pot still, without going into too much detail, but you can see on the diagram, the pot still takes the, the mash, uh, which uh, in the left, you heat it to 172 degrees Fahrenheit and 172 degrees Fahrenheit alcohol boils uh, and, and, and becomes what you think of as mist, but the water remains behind. You go up, it goes up to the cap, you have a condensate, and that gives you um, uh, the more pure alcohol. Next slide, please. Next slide. There it is. In, 18, uh, in, in 1830, a man named Coffee, C O F F E Y, you can see his picture there, invented what is called the patent still or continuous distillation. On the right, you see literally the picture of his first commercially successful still, and because I'm an IP lawyer, a copy of the patent that he filed for that. On the left, you will find, you, you see a modern ethanol plant constructed by the firm he founded in 1835 and still in business today. This, the, the, the development of continuous distillation was an incredibly important advance. Um, and in this era was as important as the invention of the internet. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the ingredients. Don't worry, there's no final on this, but at least you should know it. Um, what is gin? Gin is a distillation from mash with or over juniper berries. The important thing in gin is it has to have a predominance of juniper, juniper flavoring. It can include other aromatics, um, but in the US, it must be at least 80 proof. 80 proof is percent by volume. This is the moment where I get another drink. There is a huge controversy about what proof should be. Historically, Proof was a proof in the British Navy. And the proof in the British Navy was that the Persar was not cheating the sailors. And there was a ceremony every night or every other night on the deck of a ship where the 
sailors appointed one of their number to go up and watch as the bursar put gunpowder on a plate on a plate with a little bit of the uh, alcohol he, he he was going to serve and the they would touch a flame to the gunpowder and if the if the gunpowder went off and the and the alcohol was lit, it was said to be proved. And everyone firmly believed, and it probably is true, that if they didn't have a hundred proof um, uh, alcohol, it wouldn't burn. And there was simple solutions at sea for persers who couldn't get this to happen because the purser would not have to complete the rest of the or voyage. Uh, so this was a very important moment. Um, so in talking about proof, one has to distinguish between, so, so today we have proof, let's just take Tangeray here. Tangeray is going to say what its proof is, but it's going to be alcohol by volume. Alcohol by volume is different from alcohol by, um, uh, by weight. Um, and uh, essentially, 100 proof um, is a specific gravity of 12 thirteenths, essentially 57.15. So if you want to know what proof people used to drink gin at, it was at 57.15 alcohol by volume. Americans have always dealt by alcohol by volume. The Brits, until about 30 years ago, did it by uh, specific gravity. And you can drink several drinks discussing what's better but today, alcohol by volume is what people deal with. So 40% alcohol by volume is actually lower than what, uh, than what most gin goes out at. And I personally think gin with higher alcohol by volume, well-made, is, 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 is a better product. Not always true. Vodka, however, wants to be 40% alcohol by volume. I'm not going to go into that now, but I'm happy to discuss that, that the basis of that theory. Next. So gin styles. This is complicated because there are different gins. But the gin you think of and is usually used in making a martini is, is what is called London dry gin. That is what blue coat is. That is what angry is. That is what Beef eater is. That is what the classic gin, um, and it's a London dry style. It doesn't mean it comes from London, it means it's the style. Oh. Yep. Sorry. The, 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 there are other styles of gin, many of them, but worth, worth mentioning, and I don't know if I have any, I'll give, I'll, I'll give you a minute. Gin comes from Geneva, and that is what the gin was in 1654 in Holland. And as you know, the whole chain and the change in the uh, uh, throne in England, and they brought over uh, uh, William, uh, Dutch William, to be uh, a king. And in 1575, they issued this. You can buy this, it's very interesting, but it's a very different product. It is much more, much closer to a whiskey. The, the other kind of gin that's very popular, and I put it in a couple of the recipes, is the Old Tom gin. Old Tom gin was gin that was distilled um, in London before there was continuous distillation. And it was distilled out at a lower proof. And to mask some of the flavors, they added some sweetener to it. It's very good for different products. Um, and there is also Plymouth gin, which is a variation on London Dry, but it is, has to be done. It has to come from Plymouth, England by law. And then more modern gins, um, and some of those more modern gins, right, think of, uh, would be Bombay Sapphire, for instance, which is a lighter taste, less uh, 
less of the um, uh, of the um, of, of sort of Geneva uh, taste. Different tastes, different purposes. We use London Dry because that's the classic for the martini. Next slide. So there is a picture of a bunch of the gins I have on my shelves. You know, if you have 20 or 30 different gins, how can you call yourself part of society? Next. So vermouth, a lot of misunderstanding about vermouth, um, but vermouth um, is essentially, if you will, a, a brandy. It's a fermented grapes, which have been fortified with a distilled spirit and have some spice ingredients. They have to use wormwood as a bittering agent just by definition. And they usually add caramel or sugar. There are lots of vermouths out there. They're very popular. The Spanish love them um, and, and, and they're very tasty. Unlike gin where you can sort of get a consistency around London dry gin, vermouths have a great deal of variety. Vermouths came into existence in the, eight, uh, in the 1870s when some of you may know there was a phylloxera bacteria that came through and literally wiped out all of France's grape production. So people had to find ways to get alcohol. And what they would do is they would use fortified wines um, and, uh, and they would accept much lesser grape quality by adding liquor to them. Um, and that became removed. Next slide. Some of various kinds of vermouth there. Next slide. Vermouth really come from the kingdom of Sardinia, which now is part of Italy, Northern Italy, think the Italian part of Italy that abuts France and Switzerland. Most vermouths come from there. They had really sad, not really good grapes but they had good spices and they mastered the art of combining those spices with some fortification and passing it off originally to the French who were dying for any kind of wine-like thing. And it became its own thing um, uh, in, the, in the late 19th century. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, it's time for another cocktail. Um, so, Okay, next slide. Anyone want to volunteer to make any of these uh, other cocktails? Um, I'm happy to work with you. Uh, I know some of you actually made a couple of them earlier. We can talk about that. Um, I was going to try a South Side. Oh, the South Side's great. Who, who wants to do that? Are you going to do it? Sure. Okay, I'll, I'm going to get. Sublime, I'm gonna make it with you. What's in the South Side? It's a uh, gin, lime juice, simple syrup, and mint. Ooh, I think I have all of those things. You sound you sound sober again. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's kind of funny actually. You're getting ready to make your next drink, and you sound sober. And we're right there with you, Kristen. We're gonna make one as well. Good. Okay. Okay. One thing. Yeah. That's a fun. The South Side is a great cocktail, um, and and it is the house cocktail um, of sorry uh, the Twenty One Club in New York. I don't know if any of you've been there, and unfortunately, right now the Twenty One Club is um, closed. I don't know why they're closed, but they're closed. Um, it's a it's a pandemic thing. But I'm going to make it. I forgot. I need to get a knife. Sorry. Now, I don't have an official muddler. Can I just you bash it with a wooden spoon? I think that's a solid. You can bash it with anything you want to bash it with. Okay. No Wesleyan commentary. Ah. Well, 
21 Club claims it comes from Connecticut, okay? And you guys from Philadelphia are, look, are probably used to these stupid claims that are made by the New Yorkers, right? Yep. Uh, there, there, there are several theories, but there's actually a good argument for it to be from Connecticut, and then, then it shows up uh, in the 21 Club. But there's another argument, and the one that I like, which is that it meant, referred to the South Side of Chicago, because we're talking about a, a prohibition era cocktail, and you know one of our Chicago friends, haha. Uh -huh, um, specifically, um, and uh, I, he was from the South Side, and there's no particular reason to assume that people, when they referred to the South Side in Prohibition, were referring to a posh country club in Connecticut, when they could have been referring to the South Side of Chicago, where Al Capone was killing people and ruled the bar world. I, being a um, I like the theory of Chicago. Um, one of the best historians of cocktails, a guy named David Wondrich, who, by the way, I've talked to about this. He's written some books. And he has actually, he actually thinks it was Connecticut. Um, but he's a damn New Yorker, so what the hell? Why should I worry about him? He has a PhD from English in English from NYU, but that's NYU, you know. Um, anyway, I've talked to him about this. Yeah. Um, he, he thinks the evidence favors uh, New York, um, but he would agree that we can't figure out what it is. So I've just squeezed fresh lime juice in here. Um, I'm going to put in some sweetener, about a half ounce. And I realize I've got one other thing. Sorry about that. Normally I have this out. I didn't think about this drink. I love it though. Hold on. Need mint. We were loudly shaking. Oh, sugar. Sorry. You were loudly shaking here. So I missed what Chris said. He's missing an ingredient. No, I, you know, I, I, I have the ingredients. I just didn't bring them with me. So I had gotcha. to go to the kitchen to get some mint. Completely doable, by the way. And this one's uh, delicious. And this is muddler. So we muddle it in. And then, Peter, you'll be happy to know that this is a drink. It requires Angostura bitters. So there it is. And we're going to put a couple drops of it in. Open the Angostura bitters. Yeah, I have some more here. So hold on a second, please. It's a very interesting flavor. And I imagine it de varies depending on the kind of mint you have and the kind of lime you have. Yes, it does somewhat. Um, you know, and, and, and people are have more distinct um, tastes than I do on this. I'm going to use Angra just for fun. Um, again, this is a very classic cocktail. Um, and was very popular uh, in the Prohibition era and post-Prohibition. So I'm tossing in some gin. And some ice. And I need to get a fresh um, glass for this. 
Not a problem. I like losing these sort of old fashioned glasses. I'll show you. The depression era glass. Um, for this drink, it seems particularly good. Again, it's 40 drink, it's 40 shapes, right? Then we're going to strain this, and I double strain this because there are little pieces of the um, mint that I don't really want to get into the drink. And it comes out this very nice looking, slightly green color because of the mint and because of the um, and because of the lime, and then. You're going to do this right, and you should do it right. You're going to want to add some sort of a garnish. And in my world, that would be a lovely piece of mint, like so. I'm going to slap it just to get the aeration. And that. Bring it over here so you can see it. That is the South Side. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. How did it come out? Good. It's delicious. Although I will say my forgetting to buy mint okay. and desperately plucking the few bits that had started to grow in our back garden yeah, no. probably not as much mint as the cocktail wants, but no, it's a perfect. it's exactly a solid right. start. Right. So we're very hyper local with our mint here. <laughs> hyper local is great. Plus, it's um, nice, just nice to get something from the garden. It is, it knows that I created a cocktail for the M uh, fiftieth reunion class. Which I deny I'm part of, um, and uh, it required, and, and and I was asked to make it so that it wouldn't be too hard to make. Uh, get the ingredients. We figured out how to do that, but it called for blackberries, and it turned out blackberries uh, was difficult for some. So uh, you know, out of season mint and blackberries are a little hard to get, but they're fun. I did, even though I'm not anywhere near my 50th reunion. <laughs> like some of us. I did, I did get, I did take the recipe from Chris and make the 50 year cocktail. And it's definitely worth A, the weight or B, making it now for those of us who are not yet at that particular milestone. Highly recommend. Yeah, yeah it's a good drink. What is, what's in it besides the blackberries? Uh, I'll, let, it, I'll let Chris answer. Okay, I'll I answer. So, so uh, it's made with bourbon um, and uh, uh, um, uh, like two ounces of bourbon, um, a half ounce of, I'm sorry, uh, uh, an ounce of, a half ounce of lime juice, a half ounce of lemon juice, uh, an ounce of Honey syrup, which is just honey and uh, water, one to one. Um, and that gets shaken together with ice and then poured over blackberries, which are put at the bottom of the glass uh, with ice. And uh, it comes out pretty good. And purple. And purple <laughs> and gold. Yes, gold and pur for purple 50. without like, Horrible, overly dyed, terrible booze, which was 
the question I had asked Chris when he mentioned that it wasn't that purple, I said, I don't want to drink blue curacao ever. No. Don't we, worry. Blue curacao. We, <laughs> we met friends in, in Las Vegas uh, many years ago, and they brought a opaque, glittery purple something. It was horrible. So that sounds like And they better. said it made them think of us. Because <laughs> <laughs> of Kenyan. And we were like, no, thank you. Yeah. And it, gl it had well, glitter. Yeah, it looked like the, the list of cocktails I gave you, and you should keep it, really were are sort of the um, the list of of drinks that were around at the time the martini came out. The martini, for those of you who want to think about the sociological side of this, combines gin, which was a very English or an American item with Italian vermouth. And Italian vermouth was very new to America. It came with the Italian immigrants after the Civil War. A huge, huge in, implosion of Italian immigrants into um, New York in particular um, from 1870 to 1910. I mean, millions and millions. Of, you saw that if you saw The Godfather. <laughs> and they end up in New York and the bartenders in New York are just madly looking for new ingredients. And these Italian immigrants bring with them uh, this vermouth. And so the, there are a number of things. So you probably have heard of the Manhattan. That is also a combination of vermouth, but it is a combination of vermouth and whiskey. So uh, again, uh, a melting pot kind of drink, just like the martini. Here in Philadelphia, for those of you who have spent time in South Philly, there's a restaurant called Mama Maria's on East, on East Pashung Ave. And Mama Maria makes her own uh, cordials in the basement, including limoncello of different kinds. And many years ago, we had gone there and the, her daughter was one of our servers. And we asked her how they make it. And she said, I don't know. My mother won't tell me. <laughs> and her mother at that point was definitely like social security eligible so not the youngest of folks and she Careful. said you know we keep telling her she's gonna have to tell us the recipe eventually or this is gonna go with her now that was 2006 so I don't know what the status is with Mama Maria she's still making her limoncello and not sharing the recipe but it the was still open. the restaurant's still there um um, and she made a limoncello, like a lemon limoncello with cream and a, a whole bunch of milk. different milk and, and orangino. It was really spectacular. Ice cold. Ice cold. Yep. I, I tried to make limoncello and it was an abject failure. So I think I will leave it to the professionals. <laughs> I want to say something really quickly, Chris. Jim has been, I don't know if you can see this, Jim has been making gin for about the last seven or eight years. Oh, and wow. He doesn't have a bottle here at the moment because he's in the middle of- Well, I have a bottle, a but it's, I don't have a labeled bottle, but- Yeah, sure. so anyway, that's his label. And he's got a bunch of followers <laughs> and to whom he gives it, not sells it, but gives it. But it's, it's been a, fun. I it's would a, love a sample. It's a, com, it's a compound gin, it's not distilled. So it's basically everything is put in a, I have a large jar and then it sits there for like 10 days, two weeks and then poured off. But I have a, I have a very long list of botanicals that go into it. Sure. Uh, have, have you, I'm sure you've tasted um, Geneva gin? I actually have not. Well, you, you need to get this. Um, I'll give you two, two things you need to try. Geneva gin, Bowles makes it. Um, and it's by a, a 1575 recipe. They reissued, started reissuing about 15 years ago. Okay. It's really interesting. And it, you'll find it's similar to what you're talking about. I'm gonna give you one other, which might you might enjoy. Um, it's more, it's a little bit more floral than yeah. Yep. And a little bit of citrus. Yeah. And I love it. And we're coming into gin and tonic <laughs> yeah, season right, right now. <laughs> Almost. The other, the, other, the other spirit I will point you to, the other gin, 
is um, Mahanjan. And Mahanjan um, is made uh, in Mahan. It's from Menorca. Oh. About both Geneva and Mahanjan is they're internationally recognized as a, a, a domain, a, a, a source of origin. So you only get them from those places. But what's unique about both genes, and the, so I have to step back a second. So um, Mahan, uh, Menorca, was where Nelson kept all of his um, ships. Right. And he was battling Napoleon. I don't know how many of you pay attention to that, but the Napoleonic Wars lasted almost forever. And the Brits um, were trying to attack the French and they thought it was a really clever idea to attack them from the Mediterranean, not across the North Sea. And they had managed to work out this deal where they had these islands um, uh, just south of Marseille that were part of Spain, but got sort of acquired by the Brits. And um, in the interest of, of, of liquor research, I've gone there. Of course. <laughs> and, and if you so, ever need someone to take notes, I'd be happy to go too. <laughs> And, and so if you go there, and it, by the way, absolutely well worth the detour. Look it up, go there, it's beautiful. The deepest water port in the Mediterranean. Wow. Nelson and the Brits owned it until after the Second World War. Strategically, it was so important. Um, the Battle of Trafalgar happens by, from boats who sail from there to fight the combined fleet, and it's a one-day sail to Trafalgar, to give you a sense of how important strategically this is. But the Brits were there for 180 years. So the locals said, what do you want to drink? And they said, gin. So the locals went up to Holland to learn how to make gin. So the, the gin that they make, this on gin, which is now in the United States, hasn't been for a long time, but is now in the United States, was based upon a 200-year-old recipe from, from, uh, uh, from Holland. And I, if you're into this, you really should taste it. It's made more like a whiskey, a little more like you're making it, more a matter of, of bringing it up to a distillation percentage, unlike modern gins, which are made like Beefeater or um, a Tangray, which are done through, through column stills, where they're getting essentially vodka. They create vodka, and then they put the ingredients into it, either by maceration or um, other methods, and you get a taste from it. This, the 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 herbs and, and spices are put in, they heat it up essentially, and they then create a, a whiskey and pull it off at 140 proof. So it's a very interesting, I think it's probably similar to how you're making yours uh, and you might enjoy that. It's a yeah. different kind of gin, it's Geneva or Mahan gin. Great, thanks. Thank you. Probably more than enough, but if, if you're looking for a vacation spot in the middle of the Mediterranean where all the rich people go. By the way, just one more point. I don't know if you heard about the, the uh, Russian um, oligarch uh, who had uh, one of his ships sunk by, one, by the first mate. Um, this was news about four or five weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Where, where the guy who worked for him um, was, uh, in fact, um, loyal to his country, which was not Russia, of course. Um, and he pulled out, he essentially opened the floodgates in this uh, boat and he left, he got arrested and he was let go um, when, when, when he promised to, to fight for Ukraine when he was let go. But he's a Ukrainian, uh, he ran an, a boat and they sunk the boat. The important thing about this is 
It was in Menorca that he sunk that boat. So it was right here. So I can bring you 300 years or 250 years to current events in one drink. That's great. That's an impressive 300 years of history in one drink. 